right? Okay, so that I think that's our signal to start. So, so welcome back to the third day of QCD Miss Gravity. Uh, and I hope we're gonna hear a very spectacular set of talks as we ha have heard previously uh, this week. So the first talk today, uh, which is very exciting is uh, by Henriette Elvang. It's just gonna tell us about the effective field series and the double copy. So please go ahead. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, so there are a lot of, of work now and interest, growing interest in amplitudes and effective field theories. And a lot of this comes from various different directions. There's of course the SMEF direction, there's gravitational physics applications, both in the context of in spiraling uh, binaries and as well as understanding the UV structure of gravitational uh, supergravity models. Um, and then of course, there's the soft theorem story, their connection to celestial amplitudes and what that leads to the soft bootstrap where we explore the space of effective field theories with exceptional symmetries. And very recently, of course, we've had this push of positivity constraint EFT hedrons and ACE matrix bootstraps to really figure out in this large space of EFTs, which ones are UV completable in these bottom up type of approaches and try to narrow down to figure out as in, in talks we heard this week is, um, for example, where, where is string theory? And then there's another context, which is the one I'm focusing on here, which is the question of the double copy in effective field freeze. Largely, you can slice the space of effective field freeze and ask what in that space, which models can be double copied and which ones cannot, and which ones can result from a double copy. In other words, which type of operators are allowed when you consider the double copy? So in this talk, I'm going to start by reviewing or presenting three different puzzles of the double copy for EFTs. And then I'll discuss uh, our generalizations with, of the KLT uh, double copy with the KLT bootstrap. And, and then finally get into some new results that try to clarify what is the role of this generalized KLT kernel that we found. And this is based on work from this summer with uh, Juan Hank Chi and Aiden Hedeske, Callum Jones, Sri Paranja P. And some forthcoming work, which is this last point here with a new graduate student, Alan Chen. Okay, so first puzzle number one, let's think about uh, the quartic Galileans. So this is, this is what is also known as the special Galilean uh, in the context where there, there are no other interactions and other fields that interact with the Galilean st uh, state. So these, these models, the Galileans naturally arise uh, together with DVI in effective brain constructions. So here is um, from the work of, of Rachel Rosen and collaborators. One idea is that you start out with an effective brain action. You just have the constant term that, uh, that uh, the pullback of the metric from the, from the bulk. And that leads you to the DBI action, which of course as its leading interaction has a 4.4 derivative interaction. And then all the higher point interactions are hidden in the dot, dot, dot here. We could naturally include on the brain a curvature term and the pullback in static gauge will give you exactly the Galilean here. Now I'm, I'm writing this in a schematic form. So I'm not writing the precise interaction terms but this is the term that actually contributes to the amplitudes. And, yeah, we have and of course this type of action and we, we lost you for a couple of seconds. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, where from? From the start of the action? Just go a minute back. Oh. Okay. So, so let me just go back and talk about the effective action. How the leading term here, uh, when the, you pull back the, the space-time metric, you get the DVI terms, where you have the quartic interaction with the, some coupling G2, and higher point interactions hidden in the dot, dot, dots here. And then it's natural to include also a curvature term in the effective brain. And that gives rise to the quartic Galileans here just written schematically. And a lot of, of, these, of these type of actions has received a lot of recent attention to place bounds on the couplings G2, G3 and higher point couplings at four point. In particular at three level G2 has to be positive and G3 gets bounded in terms of G2 as we've seen in, in, in the talks this week. So, from this point of view, we have a standard field theory double copy that 
with n equals four super Yang mills, form of BCJ form, you can double copy n equals four super Yang mills with chiral perturbation theory. And that gives us n equals four super direct bone infield. So in particular, it gives the n equals four super symmetrization of the DBI terms here. So since Galileans, the quartic Galileans arise in this natural context as subleading higher derivative corrections to DVI, it might have been natural to expect that if we just included higher derivative terms to Yang Mills as well as to Chi PT, that we would get, and, and we would, we do get n equals four super DVI with higher derivative corrections. However, in these higher derivative corrections that arise from the double copy, there are no Galileans. So it simply skips this six derivative interaction and these high derivative terms over here will start at eight derivative order. As well known, we can get the special Galilean, which is the same as the quartic Galilean from the double copy, but that's from the cup double copy of chi PT with itself, not with n equals four super Yang mills. Now we actually can understand why there was no six derivative terms in this double copy that I mentioned with high derivatives to Yang to Bay Mills and Chi PT. And it's simply because the quartic Galilean is not compatible with n equals four supersymmetry. That might seem a little surprising given its origin as just a standard curvature term, but that is nonetheless true. And it's very easy to show using the on-shell matrix elements along with um, the Susie water identities. A very simple argument, and it appeared very recent in this paper with a, a student of mine, Matt Mitchell. Well, okay, so if we're not compatible with n equals four supersymmetry, we could just try to reduce the amount of supersymmetry. So let's try n equals two super Yang mills with high derivative interactions, double covered with chi PT. So that gives us some n equals two super DBI, which includes scalars, of course, and uh, high derivative terms. But again, there is no Galileans in these high derivative terms. It's not just that they were excluded by the n equals four. It turns out that they're also excluded with n equals two and in this paper with Matt, we showed that using the soft bootstrap, we could exclude uh, an n equals two supersymmetrization of the quartic Galilean when it's combined and coupled to a leading order DBI. On its own, it could be fine, but in conjunction with DBI, it's not allowed. And in this double copy, it would necessarily have been produced together with DBI, and therefore it simply cannot occur. So, you know, we have some consistency that in these supersymmetric versions, the Galileans do not show up. And we understand why from a supersymmetric point of view. If we try to reduce supersymmetry further to n equals one, then there are no scalars in the double copy. We'll just get an n equals one super born infeld model with no scalars. So we certainly don't get any Galileans this way. So the puzzle I want to highlight here is that while DBI on its own can be produced in the double copy, and Galileans on their own can be produced by the double copy. The natural combination of DBI Galileans that arises in brain effective actions do not seem to fit into the double copy. And that's a bit puzzling. Especially it's puzzling because we know from the positivity constraints that Galileans by themselves are not UV complete without a leading order DBI term. So this is, this is a very puzzling part of, of this setup. Okay, so that's the first puzzle. Here's the second puzzle. In four dimensions, there's also a quintic Galilean. Now, let's start and go back to four point where we talked about how I could get the special Galilean, which is the same as the quartic Galilean from chi PT times chi PT. Now, let me include in this story, higher derivative corrections. And of course, a natural way to get a quintic term would be to say, I start with my chi PT and then I include higher derivative corrections to chi PT. Those that certainly do exist at uh, Quincy and as, as five, um, as five field operators. For example, the West Samina Witten term could be easily included as a higher derivative correction to chi PT. So what could we expect? Could we expect that this Quincy Galilean somehow would arise from that? Well, at four point, this works very nicely in the sense that if I look at this idea of looking at all the quartic operators, a higher derivative I could add to chi PT that's compatible with the KKPCJ relations so that I can double copy them, then I generate exactly higher derivative corrections to special Galilean that I precisely the ones that you would also get from the super enhanced soft analysis in the soft bootstrap. And this works and has been checked explicitly up to eight, uh, sorry, up to 12 uh, powers in momentum, so 12 derivative order. Okay, so at four point it all works. And now the question is, 
this could we expect that when we include quintic terms, such as Westermina Witten terms, that this would also then produce the quintic Galilean. So what is the quintic Galilean? Schematically, the term that matters for the amplitudes looks like this. It's some eight derivative term. And the matrix element is just the square of the epsilon tensor. That's appealing from a double copy point of view because the Westermina Witten term is just proportional to the epsilon tensor. So this looks like a nice double copy, except of course, dimensionally, this wouldn't work out because the double copy, if you look in the KLT formalism, it multiplies at five point with a quadratic polynomial and Mandel sums. And so there's no chance that this could work out in the power coining. Moreover, the Westermina Witten term doesn't even satisfy the KK and BCJ relations. So it does not lie in the class of operators that can be double copied. In fact, if you analyze systematically what kind of five field terms in chi PT satisfy the KKBGJ relations, then you have to go up to 14 derivative order in order to get the first term at five fields that does that. So the first term that can possibly be double copied. And that boosts you up via the double copy to a 32 derivative term. And that is, of course, very far off from the eight derivative quintic Galilean term. So the puzzle here is that the five point Galilean does not seem to fit into the double copy at all. Just like DBI Galileans, uh, quartic order did not seem to fit into the double copy. The third and final puzzle is about electromagnetic duality, namely in 4D born infill theory, uh, that's a model that has electromagnetic duality, which at the level of on shell amplitudes translates to optical helicity conservation. What that means is that if I have all outgoing states, then the amplitude will vanish unless the number of negative elicity states of this uh, B born infill photons is exactly the same as the number of positive elicity photons. But electromagnetic duality is not a symmetry of Lagrangian, only of the equations of motion. And so as such, it has no reason to hold at loop level. Nonetheless, in, in this work with uh, Mario Sajantonis, Calm Jones, and Sridhar Puranjay P, we showed that uh, it, indeed, at one loop order, there's a certain scheme that at least in certain sectors allows us to cancel the effect of violation of this optical velocity rule. So for example, just like you're used to in, in uh, non-supersymmetric Yang mills at one loop order, you can have an all plus amplitude. So is the case here that there's a one loop on infeld amplitude with all plus elicities, and it takes this particular form with this particular coefficient. But you can cancel it effect by just picking this particular O plus counter term at four point. Okay, and similarly for the, for the O plus sector, for the one minus sector and for certain MHV sector amplitudes. That's not a proof that it works, but it's a strong indication that that would be the case. So given that we know that Yang Mills double copies with high PT to born infill, we can include higher derivative terms and we would get some born infill theory with higher derivative terms. However, when you actually work this out, the right-hand side here does not include the all plus local operator that is needed to restore electromagnetic duality at 4.1 loop. However, it does include other things that are needed to cancel these uh, violations of ENM duality. So it's sort of the worst situation that some things work, some things don't, but there's no clear picture. And so that's the puzzle. Why does the double copy produce some of the needed higher derivative terms, but not others? And that is indeed a much more general question. Which are the terms that actually can't be produced by the double copy? Um, this sort of hints at with this formulation of the double copy that you had a little bit of a conflict between wanting to be able to produce local terms with the double copy and being able to achieve electromagnetic duality uh, at the one loop order. So the general theme of all these three puzzles is that this involves higher derivative corrections to leading order effective field theories. And we just, we just puzzled about why this, why this what, what is actually the pattern? So what do we actually know about the double copy in the context of EFTs? These three puzzles point toward the fact that there's something to be learned about the structure. One of the things is that, that we would like to understand the rules for which operators can be produced by the double copy and which operators are allowed to be input. So in the standard field theory double copy, which is what I have described so far, we have the, the KK and BCJ relations. That's sort of the necessary input for a, an amplitude to go in on the left and the right-hand side 
And that gives a selection principle of which effective field frees can be double copied, which operators are allowed when you include them in the double copy. And that's, of course, a subject that goes back also to Dixon and Brodel, who analyzed and found that in Yang-Mills free, for example, if cube could be included, but f to the four could not. And of course, that selection principle then affects which operators can even appear after doing the double copy of the left and the right sectors. So here is an, an overview of what is known for Yang-Mills theory with high derivative correction. So as I mentioned, the results of Dixon and Brutal showed that f cubed can be double copied, but f to the four cannot. If you go to one order higher, and here I'm just including the MHV counting, there is one operator at the sixth derivative order four point that can't be double copied because the matrix elements satisfy KKBGJ relations, but another one that cannot. And there are three operators that contribute to MHV amplitude at the eighth derivative order. One of them can satisfy KKBGJ relations, two cannot, and so on. Similarly, in chi PT at four point, we, at five point, I already mentioned that the Western mean written term cannot be double copied. Um, but going to, to just stick to four point, we can start with the four derivative terms. None of those can be double copied. One at six derivative order can, but the other one cannot, and so on. There's, there's some, some selection principle at work based on the KKBCJ relations. It actually looks puzzling that we cannot double copy f to the four, because after all, we know that string theories, open strings, have an f to the four term in it. And that the double copy originally came from string theory, namely in the form of closed string trees, amplitudes being the same as the product of open string tree amplitudes. But of course, the string double copy had alpha prime corrections to its rules. In particular, the KKPGJ relations are replaced by string monodromy relations. And those string monodromy relations do permit f to the four, but they permit them in, with only one particular coefficient, only one allowed Wilson coefficient, which is linked to the alpha prime corrections that sit, or the alpha prime terms that sit inside in these monodromy relations. Okay, so we have a picture where when we use the field theory double copy, there are certain restrictions. We can relax some of those restrictions when we use the string kernel. But when we talk about a double copy of things and effective field theories with, with in principle general Wilson coefficients, it seems that there should be something in between that allows a more general picture of things that can be double copied. So all in all, this points to a, a set of questions, which are, do there exist other double copy maps with different rules? Maybe something that could resolve the three puzzles that I mentioned. And speaking of rules, what are the rules for generalizing the double copy in the first place in the context of effective field theory? And in, in fact, also more generally. So we proposed in a paper from the summer, a framework for generalizing the KLT double copy. And I would also like to, to mention that there's a general BCJ based setup for higher derivative terms by John Joseph and, and his collaborators. So in this paper here, which is, which is what I'll talk about next, we focus on the KLT formulation. So let's just think about that KLT formulation. So what, what does it say? It says that I take left sector gates theory amplitudes and right sector gates theory amplitudes, and I double copy them with some kernel, which means that I sum over a choice of n minus three factorial color orderings. And out of this, double copy map comes an amplitude uh, and that amplitude will, will be something that does not depend on the choice of these color orderings. And what ensures the independence of the choice of the color orderings in the sum is precisely the KK and BCG relations that these input amplitudes have to satisfy. So with, this would be a case where we have Yang-Mills times Yang-Mills with this kernel would give us gravity uh, with Dilton action in the, in the 40 context, and we then just submit to two forms in, in more general D dimensions. So at four point in particular, we know well what this looks like. It's just a product of amplitude. Here are two examples of different choices of, in this case, just one color orderings for the sum. Here I pick two different color orderings, one, two, three, four, and one, two, four, three. And then the KLC kernel is just minus a Mandelstam variable S. And it's a little more complicated in the case of picking the same color ordering A and B, both being one, two, three, four. Now, what these, color, what, what these kernels do is exactly providing any missing poles in this product of amplitudes, but they also cancel any potential double poles that would have been in the product. So the kernel plays an absolutely key role for this to work. In string theory, the kernel is similar, except that the S here got, will get replaced 
by a sine of pi of a prime s. And this product becomes some combinations of sines and, and cosines. Okay, so if we think about this now in a more general context where we include EFT uh, in the input and output. So we, for example, consider yang mills plus higher derivative with arbitrary Wilson coefficients for both the left and right sector. Then we'd expect to take gravity with higher derivative terms. And it's natural then to include also higher derivative corrections or higher momentum corrections in the double copy kernel. And that's exactly what string theory does when it replaces here S with sine of S. Because once you expand in small alpha prime, then you would get, of course, the leading term as the usual field theory kernel, but then you get cubic terms in the S, you get fifth order terms in the S and so on and so forth. Clearly that's the most, not the most general way of adding higher, higher order polynomials to the kernel. So string theory is, is clearly very special. But we have to make sure that once we start modifying the kernel that we don't mess up any of its key properties. It's still supposed to eliminate any double poles that occur in the product of the left and the right amplitudes. It's still supposed to provide any missing poles that weren't already in this product so that this can indeed correspond to a good local amplitude. And, and as such, the kernel is certainly not allowed to introduce any spurious poles that shouldn't be there to begin with. And that turns out to place quite heavy constraints on what this kernel is. And the key question is then, what is the rules for generalizing so that these properties are preserved? So in this paper from the summer, we proposed a bootstrap for generalizing the double copy. So what does it involve? It, it involves uh, taking what is known about the double copies, both the field theory and strings ones, namely that they have an identity element. And so we have what do we call the KLT algebra, which is simply the statement that there exists a model that when you double copy it with itself, it gives itself the amplitudes of itself back. And when you double copy it with any other thing that satisfies the appropriate either monodromy or KKPCJ relations, it also gives that other thing back or the amplitudes of that thing back. In particular, for the field theory double copy, the identity model is known as the biadjoint scalar model. So this is a model in which you have a scalar that carries two adjoint indices under say, we could call them UN and UN prime. And then it has a simple cubic interactions that involves the antisymmetric structure constants of those two groups. And that's the whole thing. But the string theory double, and, and so, so the statement is that the matrix elements of this model which are doubly color ordered, both in a, in a right and a left sector, have the property that when I double copy them with a self, with the standard field theory kernel, then they give themselves the amplitude of that same model back. And similar, any other thing I would double copy it with, say Yang Mills theory, anything else just gives that Yang Mills theory back. Similarly, for the string double copy kernel, it turns out that the right model that describes this is the biadjoint scalar model plus very particular higher derivative terms that precisely produce and would resum into this sine uh, alpha prime pi s that I showed before. Now, the key idea of this bootstrap is that if I take this KLT algebra as the fundamental rule, then I notice that as soon as I start changing the identity element in order for these relations to continue to hold, I would also have to choose a different kernel for the product. So I change the product rule, I change the identity, I change the identity, I change the product rule. Changing the identity uh, and the product rule together means that these two things are intimately coupled to each other as I'm going to show you a little bit more. And so what the idea is that it's very easy to say, I can start modifying the by adjoint scalar model with high derivative terms systematically, rather than just the things that occur in string theory, and then figure out what the corresponding product is such that this can hold. Okay, so we take this as the fundamental input. And what happens then is that the condition that the identity gives itself under multiplication that is a bootstrap equation for determining what the product rule is and the identity element, what satisfies this. And then these other relations, they become the generalizations of the KKBCJ and monotony relations. So the question we ask is if we take my adjoint scalar model and write out generic higher derivative terms, anything that you could possibly have with arbitrary Wilson coefficients, then plug it into the constraint that one times one equals one, you will get constraints on the Wilson coefficients of that model. 
And that will then be a, a bootstrap that allows you to generalize what the product rule is. Then once you have the identity element and the new product rule, you can impose those on EFT amplitude you would like to double copy. And those would be the generalizations of KKBCT equations, I guess. So let me try to show how this works a little more explicitly. So the statement that one times one equals one is simply the statement that I input these doubly color ordered amplitudes of the biadjoint model with higher derivatives. I double copy it with some kernel that is to be determined and I should give it the self back. So writing this in matrix form, I could write this schematically as some n minus three factorial by n minus three factorial sub matrices of the full possible matrices of double color ordered amplitudes. And then mn has to be equal to some and m double copied with some kernel times itself. And given and assuming that these mn's are invertible, you get back that the kernel is exactly determined as the inverse of n minus three factorial times n minus three factorial sub matrices. This is certainly true for the field theory kernel as was shown by Kajazo, He and Juan actually long ago already. And it is certainly also true for the string kernel which is shown by Sebastian Messer about five years ago. And so if I just think about this general by adjoint scalar theory with generic Wilson coefficients for the all possible higher derivative corrections, and I then look at these conditions, then it must be such that if, I, if I'm looking at single trace things only, so I can reduce everything to a possible set of n minus one factorial by n minus one factorial possible by ordered matrix amplitudes, then this condition actually imposes a certain rank condition, namely that the rank of this entire matrix has to be n minus three factorial. Okay, let's just see how it works at four point to make it explicit. So n minus one factorial is just six and I have six independent color orderings under the cyclic symmetry of the single trace. Now we have that the kernel is the inverse of a sub matrix n minus three factorial, n minus, uh, sorry, n, n minus three factorial for four is just one. And if I pick color orderings, to be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, while the ones for the sum of the KLT terms here, the alpha and the beta, I pick to be slightly different, namely one, four, one, two, four, three instead. Then I get a relation that looks exactly like this. That is what the one times one equals one means. And rearranging this, I see that it looks like nothing, but the condition that a certain two by two minor of this larger six by six matrix of all doubly other amplitudes has to vanish. But here I just picked two arbitrary sets of, of terms and it has to work for all of them. So the statement of one times one equals one is simply that all two by two minors of the six by six matrix has to vanish. And that's of course saying that we have a rank one system. And so that's what I meant that one times one equals one imposes a rank condition on the by adjoint uh, amplitudes. Fully explicitly, we can parameterize the all the four point amplitudes in terms of just three point in terms of just three functions using the cyclic symmetry and momentum relabelings. If I use this, then even in terms of these three functions, this six by six matrix of all possible doubly color ordered amplitudes has rank six. And imposing then the vanishing of all two by two minus can be solved by simply just three constraints. It says that F6 has to be the same as F1. But if you look at the, the color structure here, that is simply saying that this system has a reversal symmetry, that I can reverse the trace and I get back the same thing that I had over there. It then also says that F1 is fixed in terms of F2 in this form. And the final condition is basically a self-consistency condition, if you wish, on F2 or self-constraint. And these constraints are easily seen to be solved by the strings kernel as well as the field theory kernel, of course, because that's just an upper prime or limit of the strings kernel. And the question we want to ask is what else solves this bootstrap? That's very easy to address because you simply take the most general ansatz for uh, by adjoint scalar for the function F2. It's called, it's this F2 is the one where we flip just three and four here. So the only possible exchange channel is the S channel. And so indeed the by adjoint model just has a one over S. And then we add systematically all possible 
polynomials or all, all possible monomial terms in S and T with some arbitrary Wilson coefficients. And this, of course, then encodes, encodes all the four-point higher derivative corrections that I could possibly add. And it does so without having any presumptions about what the color structure would be of that model. Then we solve those KLT bootstrap equations that I just showed you. And we then have to further impose that the, our answer for, S, for, for F2 doesn't generate any spurious poles in F1 because that is only supposed to have poles in the S channel and in the U channel. Okay, and once you do that, then here's the result. We see that at the that, that the constant term order, there's not allowed to, you're not allowed to have anything that is ruled out that would correspond to, so basically F to phi to the four terms on the effective action, but those cannot be allowed by these rank conditions. Then there are terms, two independent terms that arise at two derivative order. And at, at four derivative order, then you have one possible term, there are four possible terms going, going ahead. And you can, of course, recover the string result. That just means that you pick these coefficients to be certain numbers and relate uh, g and, and lambda to be something related to pi and alpha prime. And everything else but these have to be zero. So to all the a odd odd with the same number is non-vanishing and everything else is zero. And so clearly this new double copy kernel is more general. In terms of the effective field theory, here's what it looks like. At two derivative order, there are a number of different terms. There's a left and a right factor that parameterize all three terms. And um, these are related to the A1 zero and A11 as, as you can see from this. Here. Okay, there's no cubic term allowed with the these. It doesn't solve the rank one bootstrap equations. There's no phi to the fourth term because that doesn't solve the rank one bootstrap equations. We do see that we get other type of color structures arising from the fully symmetric tensor structures. Uh, and these will necessarily modify the UV, U1 decoupling relations. But we're used to that also from strings monodromous. And just to point out that the strings kernel has a left equal to a right. So this generalization with arbitrary a left and a right is almost like a heterotic type setup where you can treat the left and right sectors independently. Now we could double copy with this. And the terms that satisfy these generalized KKBCJ relations are of course the usual Yang Mills. We now see that F to the four is allowed with a coupling that is prescribed by the kernel and just as it is in string theory. And then there is a pole term that comes from two F cube vertices. There's a D squared F to the four term and so on. And similarly for the right sector. We can double copy this. We get the usual gravity. We get exchanges from dilettons and axions. And then we get an enormous coefficient multiplying a local out of the four term, as well as of course, higher derivative terms. You can go up as high as you want. Um, one thing to note is that this is the usual coefficient the double copy would generate for out of the four, and that the generalized kernel actually shifts that co co coefficient. So that of course matters in cases where we have um, positivity constraints, for example, on an R to the four operator. Okay, so just briefly mentioned that to check consistency of the approach, we have solved the bootstrap also at four, five point and at six point, in order to make sure that there are no constraints at the higher point that ends up constraining us at lower point. Uh, so in, in other words, that there's no constraints from say six point or five point that end up restricting these coefficients. And the answer is, and that just summarizes the whole slide here, that there is no such thing that, that provides extra constraints on the four point system. Now, one of the things that happened in all the checks that we did was that even if we had a generalized kernel and we had more operators allowed on the left and, and right side of the double copy, then we tended to, we, we found that in all cases we checked, we generated exactly the same type of operators in the double copy, except with shifted Wilson coefficients. And the question is then why? Is it just because of a small multiplicity or load enough dimensional effect? Or is there something more fundamental here? So this might remind you a little bit of the C-theory story that you take uncorrected Yang Mills, an uncorrected kernel, and you can double copy it with C-theory to get the open string amplitudes, where all the high derivative corrections come from the Z-theory. And that's sort of bizarre that that can happen, but it seems to be maybe a similar principle at work here. 
So we're, we're setting out to, to explain this um, and to, to try to explain this. And so let me try to, to indicate how that works. So we have a standard kernel uh, of kernel with, that's the field theory limit of strings. And then we have a generalized kernel and G stands for generalized. And I, I, you know, I indicated G2 because in principle, the left and the right uh, are, are, are distinct, but it doesn't matter so much. This is just the most general thing you can have as, by the, as per the bootstrap. And what we want to know is when I used the generalized kernel with the input amplitude that satisfied the general KKPCJ relations, for example, including F to the four, is the amplitude that I generate from that the same as what I get when I take the standard kernel, the field theory limit of strings, and the standard amplitudes that satisfy KK, standard KKBGJ relations. Are these two things the same up to redefinition of the Wilson coefficient, basically shift of the Wilson coefficients? That's, that is the question, because that would then show that you would always generate the same type of operators just with shifted coefficients. So to analyze this with, with the new student, Alan Chen, uh, Alan came up with the idea uh, of the following. So recall that when we look at these identity elements, that we have these standard KKPCJ relations, which basically says that, that we have an identity element, now whether we multiply from the left to the right. Now, these right and left sectors is something that are combined into the generalized kernel. And so I could take the generalized kernel and I could impose on say its right sector, I could impose on it that it satisfies the standard KKBCJ relations. Or I could impose on it that it satisfies the standard KKBCJ relations on the right sector. If I did that, then I can use that to define what we'll call hybrid models. So basically it's a model which in the, and, and remember left and right are shifted from, are, are flipped from the identity. So in the right sector, it's standard BCJ that is imposed by the standard BCJ relations and it, it has to give itself back. And similarly, I can define a GS model, a hybrid, that is a generalized kernel on the right, but has standard BCJ on the left. So explicitly, the equations that these uh, is compact equations, uh, algebraic equations in code, is that I take the amplitudes of the standard BAS model, and I pick an n minus three factorial subamplitude, and I multiply them together, multiply them into this general kernel, and solve the coefficients such that this equation holds. Then once I have such generalized hybrid models, I can invert those n minus three factorial uh, submatrices and get new kernels. And I label the kernels based the same way as the matrix element is labeled. So S and G comes from the inverse of the identity S, uh, SG. Now, once we have these products, one can show that these hybrids are in self, themselves uh, identity elements with respect to their respective kernels. And so they satisfy the same type of bootstrap equations that we had before, and the same type they generate, gen, generate some new hybrid um, generalized KKPCJ relations. The question now is how do they interact with each other? When I take a double copy, so to speak, with the standard kernel from the field theory, of one hybrid model with the other, what do I get? Well, the natural guess is something that is general on the right, as well as something that is general on the left. And so it's natural to expect that this would actually be a way to generate, generate the standard, uh, the, the generalized kernel. But of course, it's not clear that this would be the case because the constraints of, of the KKPCJ relations from the Biagian scalar model on the left and the right of these two cases may restrict the parameters so much that there's not enough free parameters to generate this one. And it's not even clear that the product here would generate all the type of local polynomial terms that are required over here, like all the, all the different operators. If we had such a relation here, then you can basically invert it to get the statement also that the hybrid models double copied with the generalized kernel gives the standard kernel back. And then it is also natural to guess that these hybrid models are basically like basis change models that if I stake an amplitude that satisfies the standard KLT relate, KKB, KKPCJ relations, 
and double copy it with a standard kernel for the hybrid identity, I get one factor that is in the general uh, in the general category back. If I have this, then I can change faces from the generalized double copy. Um, excuse me, just one second. Ah. All right, sorry about that, a little crisis. Henrietta, can I also mention that you have uh, six minutes, including questions left? That's all good, thank you. I'll, I'll wrap it up in a second. So the statement here is that if I have these relations that I just showed, then I can directly convert the double copy with a generalized kernel into the double copy of the standard kernel. And it means these two will be the same, except we'll just shift the coefficients. So let's just test this relation. And so that's what I've been doing with Alan at four point. If I look at how many free parameters, namely these AIJ parameters I have in the generalized identity um, uh, model with BAS plus high derivative operators, we know that there were two, a two derivative order, namely A left and A right. And they directly now can be seen to come from the hybrid models using this, this structure. At the two derivative level, I have one operator, which was A to zero. It is actually over counted for in the hybrid construction. At the next order cubic, I had four different parameters, namely all these A three, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three. And then that comes directly from the top cost. We can directly account for the overcounting too, because a, a, a symmetric polynomial and STNU always solves the bootstrap. And that precisely accounts for the degeneracy that you would have. So that is okay, up to nine fold and mount this this certainly holds. Now, if I go back and look at our Pune paper, we solved the five point bootstrap up to third order and mount stumps. And it was only at cubic order and Randall stamps that we started finding new free parameters that were not fixed in terms of four point. And again, here you see that the counting works. But to go to, we need to go to higher order, obviously, to have more convincing checks. And new features appear already at the next orders, namely that you can get Lee Chivita structures and you can get terms, local terms that violate the reversal symmetry that you would otherwise have expected from the strings kernel. And so here this table summarizes the degeneracies that you have, the freedom you have in this hybrid models as well as in the generalized model. And you can see at fourth order, everything matches up. At fifth order, there's an overcounting by, by two parameters, but it can still work. And then of course we can go to higher and higher terms. And in fact, I want to acknowledge Julio for some technical help to actually make those high orders uh, work for us. Okay, so we have some evidence that this works and that will then, of course, more checks are needed, but it's some evidence that we can explain why we tend to get the same type of operators. And this is of course, very similar to Z theory. Um, one of the interesting thing here is that this may allow us to, to constrain the double copy more generally because the shifts in the Wilson coefficients are something that may not be compatible with various positivity constraints. For example, those of out of the four. And so one of the interesting questions is, can we use some of these structures to narrow down from a bottom-up approach things toward the strings kernel? And once you have things that look like the strings kernel, you would be able to narrow down the open and closed string amplitudes. So that is something that we're currently studying uh, with uh, Aiden as we can progress to try to find this type of bottom-up approach to where string theory. Okay. So, the double copy bootstrap is more than just by adjoint scalars with high derivative terms. You can start with other things. And that way you could actually address the three puzzles I started with. I can certainly come up with kernels that would at four or five points sort of give the right thing to solve these puzzles, but we haven't found any way of doing this that doesn't mess up things at higher point, at least in potentially giving spurious calls. So that is possible. So I just wanted to conclude by saying we investigated this algebraic structure of the KLC multiplication rule. We have found a generalized systematic way for finding new double copy models. These are based on minimal rank, but you could change that if you wanted to. And then we tested it in numerous examples. And this is all based on this KLT algebra. 
There are many other avenues, making contact to the BCJ version, for example, and exploring future avenues to the double copyable EFTs. And I'll finish just um, with acknowledging all my collaborators. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great talk. Um, is there any questions either uh, in the room or online? Um, maybe just elaborate a little more. Did I understand you're, you're saying uh, that by, from consistency relations, you, you could build up essentially a string theory? Uh, I missed that point. It, uh... Yeah, so, 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 the, so I, I went a little faster to, to finish. Um, so, so the idea would be that when I look at this general double copy kernel, oh, oh, let, let me take a step back. So, so Uton had, um, had a paper where he imposed the monotony relations on yang mills theory and then positivity constraints and showed that it narrowed it down to the open string. But it, it's, uh, sorry, Newton, but, but assuming the monotony relation is a little strong in view of these generalized KKBCJ relations. So one question is, can we do something more general by imposing generalized KKB, KKBCJ relation as well as positivity and ask if that can narrow us down towards this, the open string amplitude. Does, does that make sense? Sounds pretty interesting. Thank you. Maybe I can ask. Uh, the puzzle two, did these higher derivative corrections yes. solve that? This quintic. Oh, oh, oh so, yeah. so puzzle, puzzle two with a quintic. So what you would have to do is you would have to have something that is, if I, if I wanted to double copy with some in a written term to give the quintic Galilean, I would need a double copy that is a constant at leading order. And so one would have to go ahead and scrap the whole BAS model and start at five point with a kernel that just has constant terms. So you can parameterize the five point kernel in terms of eight functions. So you put in eight constants and then you have to solve the rank conditions to see if you can get this to work. So presumably you can get that to work, but then the next problem comes in and that problem is what happens when you put two of those five point kernels together to eight point and whether that would be generated in spurious calls in that kernel. So there's, so there's a different, there's a little bit of a different, so there, there are things that you can get to work at any point. And I think, I think in, in some sense, the approach that, that John Joseph was taking is like, look, if I want a particular thing to come out of a double copy at, N, at four point or five point, how can I do it? And I can get certain operators, but, but we want to, to know something like about what are the fundamental principles that allow you at all orders to get a systematic kernel. And even if I can get things to work at five point, I may not know if that is consistent at higher points. I think I may have to go resolve another crisis as we might be able to yeah. hear. I think we're also a bit behind time. So we, okay. I think we should end it there and thank Henriette. Thank you so much. Beautiful talk. Uh, so then let's get the next speaker online. So it's